Karen Emerson, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, we saw coming out of Election Day that women in general moved away from Democrats. It was one of the largest constituencies that they lost. And there are a lot of different theories about what this was. I think most prevalent among them that Democrats didn't really have a good economic narrative for unmarried women. So Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about the marriage gap in this election and what you think Democrats in general, progressives need to do to bring them back into the fold? Sure. Um, so first off, a little context. Um, right now, about half of women in this country, adult women, um, 18 and older, are unmarried. Uh, in 1960, that was only 30%. So this is one of the biggest demographic shifts we're experiencing right now as a country. Um, and it's affecting all kinds of things, um, including our politics. Um, the marriage gap is actually twice as big as the gender gap. Um, this year, uh, women voted, as everyone probably knows by now, one point Republican. Um, and so there was a, th and men voted 14 points Republican, so there's a 13 point gender gap. But the marriage gap was actually 36 points among women, 32 points among men. Um, so it's a much bigger difference than even the gender gap that we tend to look at um, more commonly. Um, and another kind of interesting, kind of both practical point to make and general context point is. Exit polls did not ask marital status uh, this year. Um, it, this huge gap is not being measured by the people who are supposed to be measuring all the kind of demographic and coalition changes that are happening in the electorate. Um, so, you know, the data that I'll be talking about in terms of post-election, what we think and know happened, it's going to all come from survey data um, that has been commissioned by WVWV and other groups. Um, the thing is that unmarried women are less likely to vote in general than married women. Um, there's about 11 point participation cap based on 2008 numbers, um, and that's probably a smaller gap than we see even in midterm elections um, because they did turn out um, a little bit better last time, like many progressive groups. Um, but they are more likely to vote progressive and vote democratic when they do show up. Um, this is for a couple reasons. Part of it is the demography of unmarried women. They're more likely to be both young and old. Um, they skewed the kind of ends of the age spectrum. Um, women of color are more likely to be unmarried than um, white women. Um, so it's a combination of a lot of different types of voters that all kind of share this common perspective of being unmarried women in the country today. Um, in general, looking at and survey data, Unmarried women are actually less enthusiastic about this election compared to past elections, compared to both married voters, uh, or married women voters. Um, and married women were actually more enthusiastic than voters overall about this particular election, um, which is part of the reason, I think, for the gender gap is that you know married women actually felt more engaged um, than even voters overall. So you know Republicans tend to win married women, and so they, that, they make up kind of that margin, that one point of Republican victory among women. But the interesting thing is that even in this election where, you know, everybody kind of moved away from the Democrats en masse, um, the marriage gap is consistent over time. Um, in 2004, it was 34 points for Kerry, um, 34 points in 2006 on the House ballot. It was 44 points in 2008 um, because of Obama and his, his own, I think, personal dynamics and the, the type of election that it was. Um, and then 36 points this year. So even when things aren't looking good for the Democrats or even when dynamics are shifting in a lot of different ways, around the electorate, uh, the marriage gap stays consistent and it's reliable and it's something that you know both parties should plan for and Democrats should try to capitalize on. Um, the other interesting thing about the marriage gap is it's consistent across demographic groups. You can look at race, age, region, even presidential vote last time, um, just a couple interesting points. Um, under, for under 55, it was 42 points marriage gap. For older voters, it was 36 points. Um, among independents, uh, we broke even among unmarried independent women, but we lost independent married women by seven points. Um, and you don't really get to lose independence and win an election, generally speaking. So um, the fact that even among independents there is this difference is really important to remember and capitalize on in the future. Um, white women, 17 point. Um, marriage gap, women of color, 12 point marriage gap. Um, you just, it just goes on and on. Even among Obama voters, um, from 2008, there was less drop-off among unmarried women than there was among married women. So it's a really kind of bankable and important distinction to remember. Um, and then the one thing that I think really was the difference in terms of turnout, um, unmarried women are 25% of the eligible voting population. There were only 19% this year of the uh, voters that turned out based on our survey data. And we'll know more once current population survey releases their report about November. 
Um, but in, in 2006, they were almost 21% of the electorate. So even as they're growing as a percent of the population, the adult population, the voting eligible population, this is the first time in a long time we have seen actually a drop in their share of the electorate. And that is, uh, frankly, a failure on the part of you know, Democrats who should have been you know, paying more attention and obviously for a 36-point gap should have been making a little bit more effort. Um, the real kind of culprit here is a disconnect between the issues that were being talked about and the sense of accomplishments Democrats were trying to portray but that Republicans were pushing back on. So 43% of unmarried women um, said that the issues they care about weren't even talked about. Democrat or Republican, they were not hearing about them. Um, and we know that unmarried women care about real kitchen table issues, economic issues. Um, and we also found, and this is more from focus group data, that um, for both unmarried women and you know, a lot of the groups that we're going to be talking about today, um, you could tell them factual things about the accomplishments that have you know, been made in this Congress or by this president in his first two years, and they did not believe they were true. They were buying into the Republican narrative, even unmarried women, even progressive groups, that we have, you know, Democrats as a party, and I, obviously I'm one because I work for Democratic Pollster, but Democrats as a party had not gotten anything done. Um, so that really, we maintain the marriage gap, but that kind of plays into we could have made more of it and we could have gotten more to turn out. And one last point I'll kind of make in general is that in addition to being less enthusiastic, unmarried women are also tend to be late deciders. And among um, unmarried women who voted Republican, about 20% said at some point they considered voting Democratic. Um, so it's a combination of late deciders and people who were, were thinking about voting for Democrats and, we, and Democrats left votes on the table. Um, there was plenty of time, even right up to the end, to reach out to these women, um, to talk about things the way they want to hear them spoken about, to talk about their issues, and it just, in the end, didn't happen the way it needed to, to really, you know, push them to turn out more. And so we'll, we'll know more about the turnout picture from this election once we have more data, again, because we don't have exit polls. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's really going to show that, you know, the turnout dropped off, enthusiasm was low, and um, there were votes that could have been gotten by the Democrats that, you know, were left. And just to ask a quick follow-up to that. So you said that they, the candidates didn't talk about these issues the way unmarried women need to hear them talked about. What does that look like? Sure. Um, unmarried women have a very low tolerance for political BS. It's kind of what we found. They like the facts. They, and this is true of a lot of, a lot of um, the, these new electorate groups, is that they want the facts. They don't want, you know, spin. They can get that on their own on the internet or on TV. I mean, it's, it's readily available. But um, they want strict comparison. You know, we've done mail tests and working with WVWV where, you know, we've tried postcards, we've tried different kind of things, both to encourage turnout and also to, um, you know, the, the action fund side of WVWV has done more kind of political outreach. And we've found that the most effective tool is just a side-by-side -side comparison. Here's are some key issues. This person voted or said this, and this person voted or said this. They want the, they want the facts because I think part of it is they want to be respected in the sense that they're smart enough to make their own decisions. You know, they're smart enough to see the facts presented to them and decide on their own, and they don't want to have to wade through the spin and the rhetoric and the whatever that people are throwing at them about the election and incumbent, not incumbent, change, blah, blah, blah. They want the facts and they want economic issues, things that actually affect their lives, minimum wage, you know, economically very strapped group. So they want specific things that are going to touch their lives. Things like minimum wage, taxes, um, health care is a big one. So it's just a matter of, I think this was an election of a lot of big narratives. And I think maybe for unmarried women, it missed the small factual comparisons. You're going to put a lot of TV consultants out of business with that. <laughs> with that. Um, well, I'm going to move on to Jesse. You know, young voters, for those of us who do um, youth vote stuff, who do millennial research, the same thing always happens, which is a week or a month before the election, all of a sudden reporters want to talk about young voters. They haven't cared about them generally for like 11 months, but now this is the moment. And then they talk about them, and I'm going to say this when we go to Andres, because it's the same with Latinos, like they're unicorns, like they're these like crazy voters. Where are we going to find the youth voters? You know, why are they, they're going to, and it's always, it's, yes, it's the, they are the new soccer moms. It is always really negative that they're just, they're not going to come out, which is a really, which reinforces itself. Um, so Jesse, they, they did come out um, at generally midterm levels. There was a slight drop off from 2006, um, but they definitely didn't turn out at higher levels. Do you think that Democrats missed an opportunity to increase turnout? And do you think Republicans missed an opportunity to make inroads?
I'll try to not shout now that I have a microphone. Um, so it's always an interesting topic because um, I could be sitting here and youth vote could have gone up astronomically and probably the headlines would have read that the youth vote didn't turn out because it seems like we never are actually able to effectively assess what happened. You know, my uh, horror story was that in 2004 when we actually saw the single largest increase in youth voter turnout, larger than the 2008 presidential election, I woke up in Wisconsin where I'd run a youth voter registration campaign and the headlines say youth vote doesn't turn out, carry lost. We had increased youth voter participation by 11%. So, um, you know, this election cycle, sadly, um, they say the youth vote didn't turn out and I can't say that that's 100% incorrect. So first, let's just talk about the numbers. Um, as was just mentioned, the youth vote this election cycle was roughly similar to the share of the vote in 2006. We're talking roughly 12%, right? So really, we didn't see anything earth-shatteringly earth different from 2006. In 2006, roughly 23% of eligible 18 to 29-year-old voters turned out. In this election, it was closer to 20%. Um, of 18 to 29 year olds. That's within the margin of error, but it does seem across the country that it went down a little bit. Do I think that Democrats missed a huge opportunity? Uh, absolutely. And I think Republicans missed an opportunity as well. What we learned over three consecutive cycles of an increase in youth voter participation is we actually know exactly what it takes to turn young people out to vote. It is not a mystery. It is not you know, some crazy long scientific or mathematical equation that we have to figure out. You have to invest in young people. You have to ask young people to vote. You have to invest money to turn them out to vote. And where that happens, we see consistently more and more young people voting. And in this, this election cycle was really no different. If you focus in, and instead of looking at the numbers nationally, you look at particular districts across the country, where there was additional resources spent to mobilize young voters, uh, especially on the independent C3 side, you saw at least 2% higher participation of young voters. Uh, in 2008, we had, and, and we, of course, we never compare turnout from a general election to a midterm election, but in 2008, we saw historic levels of resources spent to register voters. You had the Obama campaign spending tens of millions of dollars all across the country registering voters. We didn't see that investment from Democratic candidates. We didn't see nearly that investment on the C3 side of the equation. And of course, Barack Obama's campaign, while, the, while, the, um, while OFA and the DNC did spend considerable amounts of money, it certainly wasn't at the level and it didn't start soon enough to tap into the potential that was there amongst young voters. Now, here are some bright spots that I think we really have to focus on. While we keep hearing words like the tsunami that happened in terms of um, voters shifting from Democrat to Republican, that did not happen with those in the millennial generation. This is a generation that overwhelmingly supports Democratic candidates. They supported House Democrats to House Republicans by a margin of 57% to 40%. They uh, still support Barack Obama by a margin of 60 to 40 compared to, um, well, I don't even have the number, but we all know that amongst the rest of the population, the guy down the street just isn't as popular right now. So um, some other really exciting things about the turnout of the millennial generation, we know this generation is huge, we know it's demogra demo democratic, and we also know that it's really diverse. And in terms of the turnout numbers this year, amongst young people, that turned out to vote, 66% were white, 14% were black, and 15% were Hispanic, which is roughly in line with the actual breakdown amongst 18 to 29 year old voters. Those gaps have almost entirely closed. And that's pretty different compared to older voters where it was 80%, uh, an 80% white vote, 10% black, um, and, and closer to 7% Hispanic. Of course, that varies depending on particular races across the country. I think what's hard for me right now is knowing this is a progressive generation, this is a diverse generation, this is a huge generation, but that sure doesn't matter if they stay home on election day. And that requires that we learn the lessons of what it's taken to turn young people out to vote. I think wrongly one of the messages coming out of the 2008 election was 
Barack Obama was just such an unbelievable, charismatic rock star figure that we had record youth turnout because just of the fact that Barack Obama is an amazing individual and one of the most exciting presidential candidates we've seen in history. Well, I don't think any of us are gonna de deny that that was an element, right? That was absolutely an element. But that was matched with the most significant resources ever spent and an actual belief that young voters could make the difference. And we didn't see that translate into the way that Democrats, or Republicans for that matter, ran their campaigns this cycle. Um, just something that, that is less scientific and less numerically based, but um, I think it is important to also talk about the Obama factor in 2010 in terms of how long before the midterm elections did the White House start paying attention to young people? Uh, so it's not just that the media waited until three to four weeks out from election day after voter registration deadlines had ended to start asking questions about the youth vote. It's also that we didn't see Barack Obama hit the campaign trail, visiting college campuses, and see the White House really come out with a dominant youth message until very, very short before the election. And, and, and I would contend that 18, 19 months of, without a direct appeal to young voters, coming off an election cycle where Barack Obama was on a college campus nearly every couple days, where there was messaging and a real attempt to bring young voters into the equation, had a very significant impact on youth voter turnout. Um, and I think it will be interesting for us to see how the Democratic Party and the administration as a whole uh, attend to that over the course of the next couple of years. We are going to come back to that, okay. but let's bring in Andres Ramirez, if we can. We're, we're new to the Skype phenomenon, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay, Andres, we, we've been talking about, um, about different demographics and the, the perceptions leading up to Election Day about whether or not they would turn out. And so we know Latinos did turn out. I would love you to run us through some of those numbers. But part of my question to you is, you know, there is definitely a sense out there that Democrats benefited from Republican fumbles, that had Sharon Angle not run the type of negative ads she ran against immigrants and against the Latino community, that perhaps you would not have seen the level of enthusiasm that you saw coming out of, of different um, Latino groups. Do you think there's any validity to that? A and what do you think both Democrats and Republicans need to do going into 2012? Great. Thanks, Alicia. So first, let's, let's go over a couple of numbers. Uh, and purpose of the presentation. Guys, here. Yeah, I know. We can't hear you too well. But this happened the last time, and then it started working. You want to... Sam, what do you think we should do? Okay. So for for this presentation, we're going to focus exclusively on the data provided by the NEP, NEP exit poll data. Um, we're going to use that data so that it can provide us a an apples to apples comparison between what happened in previous election cycles and what happened this election cycle. And if we look at the data that's provided, it will show that. In 2006, Hispanics made up 8% of the national electorate. And in 2010, they also made up 8% uh, of the national electorate. Th this, this key number is important because if we recall the 2006 election cycle, the entire media narrative and pundits was, uh, pundit a narrative was about how much Hispanics were going to participate and influence these elections. And in fact, we know that they did, and they played a key role, and they came out at 8%. In the 2010 election cycle, the national media narrative and many pundits speculated to the contrary. And the assumption was that Hispanics would not engage as much this cycle and were not going to be as impactful in this year's election cycles. However, again, the data shows otherwise. They were just as impactful this cycle as they were in 06. And in fact, in many of the states uh, that proved pivotal, such as Nevada, such as Colorado, and a variety of, of states, even Florida, um, that Hispanics increased their level of participation. Um, so, so that for me is an important number as we're talking about how media is portraying the Hispanic vote, how media and pundits are talking about the impact of Latino voters in the election cycle. 
that in fact Latinos have maintained a very high level of participation over a variety of election cycles that we've seen now spanning this whole decade. So um, I'll go brief. So I just want to touch base with that briefly. Now to focus on the Nevada race, uh, Nevada. I'm here in Las Vegas. I was able to follow it very closely and be a part of it. Uh, Hispanics played a tremendous role. Hispanics increased their participation from 06, where they were 13 percent of the total share, to 15 percent this cycle, and overwhelmingly siding with Senator Reid. Now, there's a lot of narrative, as you mentioned, Alicia, about whether, in fact, this was Sharon Angle just as a motivating source for Hispanics. And I think it's important to understand that prior to the general, Sharon Angle had never made a critical comment towards Latinos or, an, or, or disparaging remarks about Hispanics were not part of Sharon Angle's strategy. That, in fact, this strategy happened once the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee took control of her campaign in the general election. And that we saw these tactics weren't exclusive to Nevada, although they were the most extreme in Nevada, that these same ads that were being produced by this firm were being produced in other states. Um, and that the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee's determination to oust Senator Reid just had them focus on this more in Nevada. The one difference we also saw is that unlike many candidates um, who, when they are attacked on immigration, uh, they tend to, to run from the issue, Senator Reid leaned very hard into it and took the issue head on and courted Hispanics and chose to continue uh, his record of fighting uh, for issues important to Latinos. So he didn't run away from his support for the DREAM Act, didn't run away from his support from CIR, and insisted that he would continue to push them even after he was being attacked from them. And I think it was a combination of that set of, of circumstances that really mobilized Hispanics in the state to come out. Um, we certainly saw, again, in other states where some of these tactics were used, and the candidate who was being attacked did not respond in a similar fashion or as aggressively as Senator Reid did in defending his support for these issues he was being attacked on. And so I think that's an important uh, issue to make. But this wasn't Sharon Engel's problem. This was a problem that the RSCC brought to Sharon Engel's campaign and implemented here in Nevada, and it failed dramatically for them this cycle, as it did in 06 and as it did in, in, in other cycles. All right, Andres, thank you so much. We're going to keep you with us. We're going to take your, your beautiful face down, but we're going to keep you on the line, so thank you. Um, Karen, you have been in the room where these decisions are being made when you were at the DNC, and you know, this is often what you hear. If you spend money on youth vote, you will get youth voters. If you spend money on Latinos, you'll get Latinos. Spend money on America. That's a lot of money. Um, and at some point, it becomes a cost-benefit analysis of, of, how, of which voters you're going to go after. Um, so I'd love for you to speak a little bit about that. And also, since you are a messaging person more than a field or resources person, I mean, what we're talking about here is there are unique young voter messages, there are unique ways you message to women, and we very often message in silos and do not incorporate these groups into our larger narrative. So if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. So actually, when I was at the DNC, one of the first things we did was a poll in the immediate aftermath of 2000, yeah. Uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of 2004, we, um, did polling because we wanted to understand what was going on with voters, how were they feeling about the Democratic Party, and that was largely where, you remember the narrative there was people agreed with us on the issues but they just didn't like us. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> but a lot of that, which you know really drove Howard Dean's 50 state strategy was because we were not there to make an argument. And I think when I think about these issues, I think about it the same way, and that is, you know, as a party, we need to be running a permanent campaign in the way that we do outreach to voters all the time. That's what Republicans do. They have built an infrastructure so that they are running a permanent campaign in every state all the time. We tend to, and we were kind of getting out of that model, but I think we sort of fell back into it this time of, what are the 18 states we can win to get to the magic number of 270? What are the you know, cost-benefit analysis of the voters that we think we can get? Okay, spend the money there and forget basically everything else. And it's okay if in Texas Republicans are repeating a message about who Democrats are that's not true and we're not there to actually counter that message when there may be voters there who we could actually get. 
that was a big part of the mindset we were trying to change. And I think overall, it's part of the mindset that the Democratic Party has to really focus on. You know, one of the things with the surge voters in particular and the young voters, there was a lot of conversation when uh, Obama became president about what to do with sort of the list of the OFA people versus the DNC people. And that was an, <laughs> it was an important conversation though because it's true that a lot of the people on the OFA list did not see themselves as core Democratic Party voters. They were Obama voters. And then you had obviously the DNC list which had some crossover but some people who are the people who are frankly the ones who do all the things not a single one of us in this room would ever want to have to do in terms of canvassing and copying and you know all of this work that goes on for every race from local school board up to the presidential so um, and they you know those are voters are really important those are our key voters so you know I think the decision was made really to kind of keep the two lists separate and message to the two lists separately I think part of the problem was again we were not running a permanent campaign and campaigning for ideas throughout the last two years I think we kind of gave that up and went on to I think as the president said, I think he was right about this. He kind of focused on just getting things done and sort of left the infrastructure piece, which is, you know, whether it's online, whether it's mailing, whether it's canvassing, whatever it is, you've got to have the infrastructure that you're constantly communicating with people and making them feel engaged. We didn't do that. Um, and I think, you know, the other reason why that's so important is if you look at the changing demographics of the country, and particularly if you look at some of the results from 2006 in particular and 2008, we know that a lot of those races, and you can see it now in some of these undecided races, are won by margins of like 500 votes or 2,000 votes. So when you talk about leaving votes on the table, that's a congressional seat, right? And that's where it becomes very detrimental to the party. The Republicans, I think, do a better job of understanding that than we do. And so I think that's another really important element that we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to think in this sort of siloed way about how we're going to go after different kinds of voters. And instead, we need to be looking at states and the demographic of, demographics of those states and figuring out how are we going to engage those voters. I thought what Andres was saying was really interesting, too, because it, you know, it was maybe, what, three weeks before the end of the election when finally, I mean, I had been trying to talk about on MSNBC and a lot of others were, but it really didn't pick up. And talking about, you know, there was a study that showed the difference that the African-American vote could make in 20 House districts. There was a specific study about the youth vote. There was a specific study about the Hispanic vote. I mean, and again, those are specific congressional districts we were trying to win, and it was like a road map that said, here's how you can win. <laughs> and yet, you know, instead we went another direction. So I think that is a, definitely a cautionary tale. Um, and then just broadly, you know, I think in terms of turnout, the voters generally turned out in the numbers that they did in 2006. It's that we didn't get those, again, surge voters that we got in 2008. And you had independent voters go with the Republicans, unmarried women, you know, and I think actually one of the reasons that the married women went to Republicans is that their out-of-work husbands were driving them crazy. So they, you know, are like, we need jo I need jobs, I need to get this guy out of the house with a job. And also, frankly, for a lot of married women, they're the sole breadwinners in a lot of these families where, because, you know, men were more laid off in higher numbers than women because guess what? We're cheap labor. Um, and, and when you're not messaging to married women about the economy and jobs and you're trying to talk to them about choice, you know, that in, a, in an economy like this, that's not what people want to hear about. And so that goes to your point about messaging, which is, I think one of the things the party has been, both parties have been slow to recognize is the need to really change the dynamic and the paradigm of how we're messaging to voters. You know, to African American voters, particularly younger voters, you can't talk about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and expect it's gonna have the same resonance as talking about schools in your neighborhood, the economy, your future, those kinds of things. And similarly with women, just talking to me about choice is not necessarily, particularly younger women who are not as, um, maybe don't feel the same sort of sense of urgency of what it would be like if you didn't have a choice, you've gotta broaden the conversation. And so I think the siloed messaging is important in that it's important to understand what issues resonate the most with each community, 
although generally I think it ends up being the same set of issues, it's just how you talk about them. So it's jobs, the economy, healthcare, social security. You know, again, unmarried women, part of the reason they care about social security is, this is my case, I've got two older parents. So I'm thinking about, I hope their social security is gonna cover them because if it doesn't, do I have enough to cover them? That's a different conversation than talking to a senior about social security or a 20-something about Social Security. So again, I think we need to recognize that it needs to be a broader conversation of issues targeted to bringing it home to why does it matter to you as an individual. Whew. Okay, so let me just ask one quick follow-up to that and then we'll open it up to the audience. So, so we're saying ostensibly Democrats were given a roadmap to victory, right? They were given these studies. And was it too late for them to change course? Is part of this is a sensitive question, but is part of the challenge that the demographics we're talking about are not equally represented in the higher levels of party committees? I mean, why do you think you're given something that says I can help you win 20 congressional seats and you say, not going to put my money there? You know, I think some of it is probably that there is a little bit of magic thinking that goes on. That again, we're so focused on the cult of personality. It was Bill Clinton and then it was Barack Obama in terms of how we're going to turn out voters instead of having the machine in place to do it. I mean, again, as they say jokingly, Republicans can get any fool elected, right? Because they have the infrastructure to do it and they know how to get it done. I do think, you know, I think the DCCC and the DSCC and the DNC, they did spend um, more money this time and do a lot more this time than we were able to do in 2006. That's a great thing. But again, when you show up just before the election and try to do it, it's not going to have the same kind of resonance. And frankly, I think voters are sick of it. They're sick of... Um, you know, people showing up and asking for their vote a few weeks before the election when it's like, well, where were you when I really needed you? And, and I think a lot of voters, particularly these surge voters that we're talking about, I mean, you know, when I left the DNC, I mean, it was very clear because we did additional polling and we paneled back to those same voters from 2004. So we had been able to track where they were four years later as well as an oversample of the surge voters so that we could understand where people's heads were at. And they were with us, but they were tenuously with us, meaning they were up for grabs. And I think the strategy that was pursued this cycle was more, you know, sort of the old school strategy and not recognizing that, again, just because an Obama voter voted for Obama does not mean they're going to come out and vote for Democrats. All right. I bet there are lots of questions right here. Yes, I Sorry, Hillary will have a yeah. mic, so uh, no need the, to for shout. The, for the speakers about the women vote and the youth vote, what about registration? Were the registration numbers down as well? Because that couldn't be fixed even if people wanted to vote at the end. And I wonder whether we just had the timing all wrong. I mean, the registration numbers were definitely down because we didn't have the infrastructure or the resources, either on the C3 side or the partisan side, to do the level of registration. Even though there were, was historic levels of money spent in 08 to do registration, what do we know about young voters, and this is also true of a lot of um, unmarried women, is they, that they move and you have to do the registration all over again, right? All over again. Um, and one of the things we need to consider as we think long term about how do we make young people or how do we make unmarried women a permanent active part of the electorate is, uh, there's two ways to look at that. One is that we need to make sure we have the resources and infrastructure built election cycle after election cycle. The other thing we need to look at are the institutional barriers that we have in place that actually disenfranchise people of color, young voters, young women, unmarried women from actually participating in the electoral process. So, you know, I, I was speaking with Heather Smith, the executive director of Rock the Vote, and the number of hits they got to their voter registration tool in the days and weeks immediately leading up to the election after the registration deadline had passed all across the country indicates that we have a real problem in how we, in how we deal with voter registration. Um, and I think that absolutely has to be part of the conversation moving forward. Uh, I don't think it's the, I don't think same day registration is the silver bullet, but as a 
native of Wisconsin and somebody who has done tons of political organizing in Wisconsin. We certainly did not pull out victories across the board in Wisconsin this time around, but we do have higher youth voter turnout in Wisconsin than nearly anywhere else in the country. So moving towards same day registration helps Democrats in particular to engage their base of voters. Making sure that the, um, you know, again, it's about, I'm gonna go back to my little infrastructure bit here because it's about making sure that at the state party level they are able to run campaigns to tell people you know voter registration deadlines are coming this is what you do this is where you go click here and, and, and basically putting those resources forward knowing that that is as important as actually then getting people out to vote yeah I would agree I would just add to that a, a personal anecdote actually I, I vote in DC which means I don't really vote for much that counts but um, so I went to vote in the primary this year and the polling place didn't know what to do with me because I'd moved since the last time I voted in DC and I went and they didn't have any voter registration forms I mean they ha technically had same-day registration or provisional ballots or whatever they didn't know they're just like just go to your old precinct which is what I ended up doing but I think that you know I heard it here voter fraud right right <laughs> yeah um, so, but luckily it was only, it was only citywide things, so I didn't vote on anything in, in any place I shouldn't have been. But, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I kind of agree with everything that's been said in terms of there is no silver bullet, but, you know, it does start with registration. I mean, if, if you wake up one day and think, I want to go vote, but, oh, I can't register, you know, same day might help, but there's a lot more education and outreach that needs to be done from the get-go to make sure people understand what they can and can do, where they can and can't go, and just to make things easier, you know, especially for unmarried women when you're, you're the only one responsible for you, and a lot of these unmarried women are unmarried moms. Um, you know, you're the only one making decisions. You're the only one taking care of your household. I mean, even if you've got a roommate, you know, it's not the same as having, like, a family kind of structure. So it needs to be as easy as possible um, for probably all these constituencies, really, um, unmarried women, young people, everything. Um, but, yeah, it's just kind of ease and making sure that the systems that are in place are actually working would help. <laughs> Next. Good afternoon. My name is John Del Pino, and I don't have a question per se. I just want to thank all of you for the effort you put into preparing for this. It's obviously clear you have a marvelous command of statistics, first of all, and also the, a lot of the central issues in, involved. And I really appreciate, and certainly we all do, the effort you put to prepare for this. That's all I had to say. And isn't it nice to see four women on one panel, plus Andres? <laughs> it's like, I've never seen this before, not talking about women's issues, which is really something. Uh, yes, any, there we go, back in the back. So we know that um, millennials are predisposed to Democrats. Is that, do we have any way of knowing if that's a function of their generation or a function of their age? And to what extent voting patterns will change over time? I'm, I imagine that the boomers voted differently in 1972 than they did in say 2004. So uh, can you address that? Well, there is this conventional wisdom that as you get older, you get more conservative, right? right? I, I always mess up the quote, but there's some quote <laughs> right, right, no brain, right. So, so that, that is the conventional wisdom. I, I actually think that will prove wrong with the millennial generation. There's a lot we know about... Because of um, diversity or in part? Or, uh, pardon me? In part because of diversity, cultural I think diversity. definitely in part. This is the most diverse generation in American history. We're starting to see trends. We know that if you vote in three consecutive elections for the same party, that is the greatest predi predictor of your party affiliation. If you look at this group, we've seen increased voter participation over the course of the 2004, 2006, 2008 election cycles. You can follow, follow big groups of voters. They have overwhelmingly voted Democrat over the course of those cycles. So there's a lot to suggest that they will remain progressive voters. Um, so I. Uh, you know, earlier we mentioned that it's important to define them not just as young voters but as millennial voters because there's a lot of factors that are unique to this particular group. I like to definitely say millennial voters begin in 1981 because that's when I was born. And uh, as I age out of the youth movement, I got to stick in as long as possible. Um, because right, because that and that is 18 to 29 year old voters right now. So, uh, so you know, it remains to be seen. We'll have to do more studies. I, I think one thing is for certain that Democrats should not read into that 
that these are securely Democratic voters and they no, don't need to invest in the resources because part of the surge in participation, certainly in 08, was very much directly connected to Barack Obama. And regardless of how Democratic they may lean, the issue of actually engaging them and making them feel important in political process and turning out is ultimately going to be the most important factor. So my, my question is the M M MSNBC contributor. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you talked about uh, how the, uh, the Democrats, well, the DNC was in charge of reaching out to voters. Um, my my question is is, is who's who's in control of that? I mean, why, you know, why we haven't, you know, why haven't the resources actually reached out until October, you know, late September? Um, and is it because of the primaries of you know, the DNC say you know we don't want a part of the primaries? Like, what co what is the cause of waiting, quote unquote, so late? I, mean, I would say, in fairness to the committees, I I do want to point out that they raised record amounts of money this time, and that should not be overlooked. I mean, they particularly on the congressional campaign side, they worked incredibly hard, but also our candidates had tougher primaries, tough general elections where as we know, inordinate amounts of money was being spent against them. So the money game was definitely hard this time in terms of trying to figure out the best use of resources. The DNC generally, you know, it's hard when you're at the DNC, because technically the job of the DNC is to elect the president. So, and which is always the tension because in an election year, the congressional campaigns, they want money. And, you know, and they say, well, help us this year and we'll help you in, in your year. And so the DNC generally tries to focus on ways to help candidates, but in ways that will also then help in the next presidential election in terms of how they target resources. Because obviously if you have limited resources, you've got to spend those resources wisely. I think in this instance, you know, a lot of money was, was spent on TV advertising and some of the other traditional things. And again, I think the, the thinking was just, uh, not there at the beginning that said, okay, we need to put aside this amount of money for voter registration or and making sure we get people registered on time and then this amount of money making sure that once we get people registered that we're communicating with them through the primaries so that we know we're going to keep them engaged going into the general elections and that we're going to look at some of the places where it's not just about can we turn the black vote out the last two weeks or the Hispanic vote out two weeks, but really take a more holistic view. And what tends to happen in political parties still is that, you know, there's somebody who deals with the Hispanic vote, the black vote, the women vote, <laughs> right? And so it, it gets very much siloed rather than taking a more, a more holistic approach, say in a state like Wisconsin and saying, okay, how many votes do we need to win? Where are those votes? How are we going to get them? Rather than, you know, okay, can we get a little, bit, a little bit of this and a little bit of that? So, I mean, some of that I think is a matter of um, we, the party needs to change its thinking, and part of the way that will happen is more people, more millennials, um, and, and more people with diverse opinions being in the room when the decisions get made. Yes. Um, I uh, listened in on an OFA call um, in, I think, late May or early June, just to see what they were saying. And they announced to the thousands that were on the call that their strategy was going to be that they were going to go after first-time voters from 2008. And I was very excited about that because I thought that would be a group that would need help uh, because they weren't as likely as somebody who voted three, five, seven times. Did that not happen? Did they change strategy? Because it, it, it didn't seem like that was a, a constituency that they really did go after. Um, I actually don't know enough about the OFA strategy to make a comment about whether or not that strategy changed or the scale to which that program was actually effective. I can tell you that, um, you know, amongst the young people that did vote, 84% of them had voted 
in the 2008 election. So largely the people that turned out in this election were people that had turned out in the previous election. Um, I don't know what percentage of those were first time voters in 08, but certainly participation in 08 was a factor in participating in these midterm elections. I also think the nature and the messaging and how those voters were being reached out to made a really big difference. Um, and I, I don't think, uh, without getting into a whole critique of President Obama and the administration and the strategy that has been execute, executed over uh, the course of the past couple of years, I, I do think it was a real factor for young voters that they went from the height around the inauguration of actually being told and feeling like they were a centerpiece of that successful election and they were a part of changing America and they were part of that history to largely feeling silence for many, many, many months after that. And that's not to say that the passing of health care didn't have a huge impact for young people across the country, young voters, millennials, or so or the or the stimulus in some you know, effect didn't impact these voters, but it, it was perceived in a completely different way. And if you look at the issues that were at the absolute top of at least young voters and millennial voters list, they didn't necessarily see the president, who was a compelling connection to elections and the political process for them, standing out on those, on those issues. Whether it was standing out and fighting on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or comprehensive immigration reform, or the DREAM Act, or climate and energy and environmental issues, we know behind the scenes that was happening, but not in the way that they felt the president campaigning over the course of the election. And the other thing I would just add to that is, again, the the surge voters, those Obama voters from 2008, they are up for grabs. And I think in some instances, Republicans did a better job going after them than we did, period. And I think some of that was, you know, it's a midterm election. You know, some people, I think, bought into the whole it's a midterm election, party in power always does bad. Uh, some of that were, were your independent voters and your unmarried voters, unmarried women and your married women uh, that, we, that he was able to pull last time. And, again, I think recognizing that they're up for grabs, you know, I give the Republican Party credit because they they heard that message, they got it, and they figured out how to get to those people. So you actually would find a way higher percentage than one in five on a college campus. There is a huge divide between the participation and turnout of college students and non-college students. So that number is brought dramatically down by 18 to 29 year olds um, that are, are non-college students, non-college educated, which is still a majority of 18 to 29 year olds. So that's a really important factor and I actually think a lot of the strategy within the youth sector continues to be to focus on college campuses because it seems like you can get the greatest bang for your buck, they're all in one place kind of thing. Um, but actually where the resources and innovative strategies are most needed are amongst non-college youth. Um, Turnout, there, there was a, a real peak in midterm turnout amongst young voters in 2006. So it was slightly lower in 2000 and 2002 and slightly lower than that in, in, in 98. So we, we've seen a steady increase. Um, I would not put too much into the decrease from 23% to 20%. Uh, there's still more numbers that need to come in and it, it is within the margin of error. And like I mentioned, the share of the overall vote remained the same between roughly 12% of the overall electorate was young people in 2006 and, and 2010. But we, I mean, part of the you know case that I make as I go across the country and I talk to donors and everybody about why the investment in the millennial generation is so big, is so important, is because of how big we are and how much growth potential there is within the millennial generation. And if we don't figure that out, Democrats are in real, real trouble long term, right? There's something like 44 million eligible young voters. We need those people in 2012 in a really, really big way. And they don't just appear. It requires a real strategy and investment and registration resources to get them to turn out.
Yeah, and and I, I will let Karen answer this as well, but you know, part of the challenge is that a lot of the political punditry and a lot of the people who write on this really are not tuned in to the fact that America has profoundly changed. And so, you know, we heard all this, this is 1994 all over again, and Simon and, and, and our two NDN fellows, Micah Morley, we're very quick to point out that this is not the same electorate it was in 1994. You didn't have millennial generation voters. You didn't have the same percentage of Latino and African American voters. And party ID has changed tremendously. You see, a, a, is it a plurality or a majority? Plurality of Americans who identify now with the Democratic Party. Wasn't the case in 1994. You know, it was what you said, liked the ideas, didn't like the brand. That has actually changed. And so part of it is getting people who are part of the media themselves and who are in editorial board meetings who may not be part of any of these demographics to recognize that the country and with it the electorate have changed. Karen? I think that's right. I think it's also a matter of, you know, again, it's a, a lot of it is about who's in the room when decisions are getting made, who's in the, in the room for the editorial meetings when the conversations are happening. Um, there's a lot of group think that goes on in, in Washington and in New York. Yeah, <laughs> of people sort of talking to each other and convincing each other of the same thing. And, you know, part of it is why, though, it's important, you know, organizations like NDN help to ensure that new voices are moving up through the sort of chain of command, if you will. Can I use that in our development materials? Yes, you may. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, you may. Um, but I think, I mean, you know, that's a, you know, it's a, a big piece of it. Like, I think it matters on certain networks where you have more women who are part of uh, delivering the news because they, they know in their own lives what's going on, so they understand that. More people of color, younger people. I mean, I think that's why it's so important, you know, that as this electorate is changing and the demographics of the country are changing, that more people are sort of, like I say, in the room when these conversations are happening. Let me just make one point, which I, I think most of the coverage of this election, and perhaps rightly so, is a focus on who did who turned out to vote, right? They say, you you know, your voice is heard, you matter when you turn out to vote. So everything we hear about, you know, there's been this huge swing, the country's in a different place, they feel really different. Well, that's who turned out to vote, the people who have had that, you know, shift in mentality, who are angry about the state of affairs of, of where the country is at. Now, I think for the purposes of this conversation, we're as interested in the people that didn't turn out to vote, that, that aren't appearing in any of these numbers because we know how important those people are in determining what 2012 will look like and, and future elections will look like. So I, I, you know, I've been frustrated, although I shouldn't, you know, I preach to young people all the time that, you know, you're, you, you don't matter in, in a bunch of ways if you don't turn out to vote, and yet I've been frustrated that the whole conversation doesn't at all reflect you know, the millions and millions of us that didn't turn out to vote who are actually still very much a part of this conversation. We're going to go to Simon, we're going to go to Claire, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, and I just have a quick comment, and something, uh, building on something Jesse said, is that of all, I've been in politics for almost 20 years, and, and one of the things that I think about so much is how did we end up with an electoral system where at the time of maximum interest in participating in voting is the only time you can't register to vote, right? And, and it's, and it's, you know, it is something that is so inimical to everything that democracy and, and, the, and uh, the whole theory of the United States and frankly the Democratic Party that it's just something that we have to change. I mean, it's just one of these things that has to become a universal progressive fight because it's so against our core values and frankly I think the, the core American creed. And it clearly is a, a hangover, I think, from an, a, an era where things like that were possible, right? And we won't have to get into whole the history of how this all came about, but it's an extraordinary thing, and I look forward to working with you, Jesse. You to, to sign me up for that campaign. Yeah, would you also yeah. just add a quick bit about when we talk about how the, the narrative and the media coverage of this has been changed? Part <laughs> I'll be very brief about this. And but for, you've written a lot, so go to any Yeah, and stories. for those of you, for those of you who don't know, I, I waged a slightly lonely campaign to discredit uh, Rasmussen and Gallup uh, for their polls, which have now been universally decried as having been way off and, and misleading during the election. We were the first ones to call, you know, BS on the uh, on on those polls, and in part because look, the the, the challenge with polling now is if you're doing quick and dirty polling. 
using very traditional techniques of phones, you're dealing with an electorate that is changing every two years, right? I mean, we have a changing population. You have uh, these different, part of what wrong with uh, Rasmussen, I mean, uh, with Gallup, was they had this kind of crazy screen about interest in voting that had no real analog to actually who voted, no, ana no relation to who actually voted. But we have the issue of mobile phones and mobile populations and low lower socioeconomic groups. Pew Center just put out a report in October saying that if you use traditional polling techniques, you're probably going to be, your audience would probably be 5% more Republican than it would be otherwise because the new electorate is so hard to capture using traditional polling techniques. And it's one of the reasons why we saw, I mean, there was a period three weeks before the election where the gap in the, in the poll, I mean, the spread was 22 points among likely voters, depending on the poll that you looked at. That's pretty hard to do from a statistical standpoint, right? So, and part of that had to do with these sort of crazy assumptions about who's voting now. And so this is a big issue for those of you as a takeaway that this disruption and this disruption both of demography and media is making traditional market research methods um, uh, challenged and, uh, and could, very, it could create very wide discrepancies as we saw in this election. I would just add to that too. I mean, you have to also look at who commissioned what polls because, you know, every, people are ego driven, right? So people, if you invested time, energy, money into a Rasmussen poll or a this polling firm, as much as I love Celinda, or a that poll, you want to believe that your numbers are good because you're going out in the media and you're defending those numbers and you're saying, you know, that's the gospel. And Simon's exactly right. I mean, there were weeks where, like, there were just wildly different numbers. And nobody, it was amazing to me that nobody caught on to that. Like in terms of reporters, they still would say, well, this is what our polling shows. I mean, it was astounding to me. But again, I think part of it is that the media has also gotten into the game of trying to give their version of the facts and do their own polling and have their own, and you know, as, as campaigns do. I mean, look, campaigns are trying to convince people about you know their candidate and the tenacity of their campaign based on polling. And as Simon said, the methods are changing, but also it's hard to overcome that in, in the media universe because again, these guys are so invested in you know polling partnerships, frankly. Claire, you're our last question. I'm very interested in what you guys think about the fact that women who are a bigger part of the electorate and who vote traditionally more didn't vote this time and that the economy was such a big issue and that both parties and basically the media, the culture itself doesn't seem women as major breadwinners. And in fact, they are right now in this economy and they make such sorry wages, 77 cents for the dollar that a man makes. And the sort of the cultural disruption to the family normally thinking of the man being the breadwinner and the woman being secondary. And the fact that neither party really talked about that. They talked about the bad economy and blah, blah, blah. But they didn't talk about just kind of what it meant to be shouldering um, either your own or your family in terms of the economic burden. And the fact that, and I'll, I just, we just talked about people who talk too much now. I'm, doing <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps though from what you're saying. So you're <laughs> on to something. But, uh, and you know, Paycheck Fairness, this bill that was just, you know, it passed the House and it just is like a vote behind in the Senate and the, and the party didn't get behind it, the administration. So I'm very curious as to what, after I rambled on and gave my, you know, epiphany, I mean, litany, what, what, what um, especially from um, the polling point of view. Sure. Um, well, it's interesting, and just in working with WBWV and other organizations, that it seems like this has been an election about broad narratives. And I think this kind of goes back to also just kind of the media missing the small stories of the demographic shifts and that kind of thing. Because it's very nice for a pundit to be able to get up there and say, well, this is a change election, or this is about people don't like incumbents. And they miss a lot of the underneath stuff, because you really have, you know, a lot of individual elections that are really key. Um, but I think in terms of the, like, Lily Ledbetter and, you know, equal pay and all that kind of stuff, it got lost in the bigger picture, and I think this was such a panic election, and I think, you know, one of the reasons that women didn't hear what they needed to hear, um, and I think 
frankly got fed up. I mean, you know, women who traditionally, they traditionally vote more, Democratic, unmarried women the same. I think when you get to two days before the election, you haven't made up your mind, and maybe, you know, being someone who is generally a Democrat, you just can't stomach voting Republican, you're going to stay home. Um, and I think that, so the missing the message was a huge part, I think, of why women were more, you know, were one point Republican this time overall, and why unmarried women um, in particular, and lots of other types of women just didn't show up. Uh, I just think that it was, it was too broad-based, and um, it, they didn't focus, and they didn't, you know, the economy obviously is a universal theme that every group, Democrat, Republican, whatever, wanted to hear about, but again, it goes back to the talking about in a way that connects to the group that you're trying to reach just didn't happen. Um, there were small efforts, like, very, you know, different groups who kind of understood and who, you know, WVW being one of them. Who That's women's voices, women's oh, votes. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So. Uh, Paige, Paige was the original speaker today, so she was originally on the agenda. But from women's voice, women's vote, they're one of, you know, a few organizations that I know of that actually, you know, kind of sound the bell for unmarried women for these specific issues and think, let's think about how unmarried women live and what their concerns are and what touches, you know, their pocketbooks and stuff like that. Um, and when you're kind of the lone voice, you can shout as loud as you want. You can send out mail pieces till you know you run out of stamps. But if you're the only one, and the big narrative is is missing it, um, then it's just it's not going to break through. And I think that was kind of the failure here is that those are very important things, but they got lost in the bigger things that Democrats were still trying to prove were important and that they had accomplished, and they missed some opportunities. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, look, again, if you don't give people a reason to vote for you, they're not gonna. And I think a lot of the messaging didn't target women effectively. Um, and did, and again, you know, I, I really do believe there is something in this sort of um, psychological element of being, if you're a married woman with a family who maybe your husband lost their job, you're struggling, you know, we were not talking to you in the way, we're trying to explain to you our list of accomplishments. We're not understanding what you're, the burden that you're shouldering. Similarly, like she said, with unmarried women. So I think the biggest piece is we've got to understand that it's a more fractured electorate and we've really got to pay closer attention to how we talk to people. Well, thank you all so much. Um, now let's give them a big round of applause. Karen, it's nice to hear you talk in more than 20 second bits. It's like I, yeah, I have a lot to say. Uh, if you want to learn more, we have a whole 21st Century America page on our website that does lots of demographic deep dives into all of this. So thank you so much for joining us.